Well, good evening. As you open your Bibles to Revelation, the 11th chapter, as we continue in our study. I've been enjoying the study. I get to study a lot, and this is one of the books that uh, it's hard, and it takes a lot of study to, to try to figure out some of the things that are being said here, and we come to one of the, the more, I guess, uh, controversial passage of scriptures, a lot of opinions on what goes on in chapter 11. If you look at verses 1, 2, and 3 tonight, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we humble ourselves before you and we break open your word tonight, Lord, I ask that you reveal truth to us, that you reveal yourself and your Son. And Lord, let us hold fast to the promise of victory. And Lord, let us hold fast to our obligation and our call to serve, that we share the gospel of your Son to a lost and dying world. Father, thank you for grace and thank you for mercy. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. As we study, I want to remind you, as I do each week, that John is having a vision. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He is having a vision from God. And the theme of Revelations is the victory in Christ. That is what this revelation is about. It's about Christ. It's about our victory is about spending all eternity with the Lord Jesus in a place called heaven. We've gone through ten chapters now, and as you've been studying with us, that you realize that nowhere in the ten chapters have we seen, have we found, have we read, or has there been any indication that the church has been removed through ten chapters of Revelation. The church is still here. The church is going through some trying times, but the church is always given the same understanding that we are to be about the king's business, that we are to be about sharing the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me remind you that there is a, a couple of uh, theological terms that we must always remember. Uh, Billy Graham made one of them famous when he said justification is, is being made just as if we'd never sinned. Justification is followed by sanctification, and sanctification is the process of being made holy. And that process of being made holy after being saved, just as I've never sinned, is going through the trials and tribulations of life and growing in our faith. And that leads us to glorification, and glorification is only completed when we look upon the face of Christ. So going through Revelation and the things that are found in Revelation will be part of the process of sanctification. Trials and tribulations will grow us to look more and more like Christ. So if we want to look more and more like Christ, if we want to be more and more like Christ, we have to have the trials and tribulations of life. Why would we want to avoid them if they grow us? and cause us to be more like our Lord and Savior. Notice that we've also have looked at the seven seals in chapter 6 and 7. When you come to the end of that, we go into the, the trumpets. As we go into the trumpets uh, in chapters 8 and 9, then we come to chapters 10 and 11, and we have a break, and that's what we're looking at tonight. As you look at the trumpets, in the first trumpet, we saw the judgment on the land. In the second trumpet, we saw the judgment on the sea. In the third trumpet, it was the judgment on the fresh water. In the fourth trumpet, the judgment on the heavenly bodies. 
in the fifth trumpet, the pit was opened and the locusts came out and the locusts had stingers like scorpions and so it was a time of torment and torture. And then we come to the sixth trumpet and it's about death, but it's also about God claiming his deed to the earth. And so we come here to chapter 11. And we look at verse 1, and we see the measuring. And in verse 1, John is having the vision. He's been told to write. And then all of a sudden, the angel says, here's a reed. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. So there are several things that he is told to measure. Now, first of all, the reed is a measuring reed, and they grew in that area, and, and, and they would be light, they would be hollow, and he would cut them, and they would be cut to a certain length. They would be ten and a half feet. And they were used in building and construction. It's kind of like a measuring tape that we would use today. It would be something similar to a yardstick. Uh, and y'all know what yardsticks are used for, right? Around my house when I was a kid, they were used to beat kids. And, but a yardstick is a, is a set measurement, so this, this measuring reed would be ten and a half feet. He said measure the temple. Well, this would strike John as somewhat kind of out of place because the temple, as he's having this vision, has been destroyed. There has been a rebellion in his home. Israel had gone into rebellion against Rome in 70 AD, and Titus had come in and destroyed Jerusalem. He had wiped out Jerusalem in a sense. He had tore down the temple. He had tore down the walls. He had cast down 100,000 Jews from the walls for sport, and he had sold off a million Jews into captivity. The great dispersal as the Jews left their homeland and went to different places to live. And so, all of a sudden in this vision, he's told to measure the temple. Not only is he to measure the temple, but he is to measure the altar. The altar in the description found in Exodus is a place of worship. And he is to measure how much worship is actually taking place in the temple. So he is to measure the size of the worship, the size of the worshiping place. But not only that, what is, what is somewhat uncommon, he is to measure those that are worshiping. How do you measure people? How do you measure the size of a person's worship? with a reed, with a measuring stick. There are standards. And I believe that that is what Jesus is telling us. There is victory, and so with victory, there must be certain standards of worship. We've gone through the judgments that are being poured out on the earth, and yet the church is still there, and so as the church is there, John measure the style, and the quality of worship. Where is the temple? Where does Christ now dwell? In the heart of the believer. So measure the believer's heart. Where is the altar? The altar is in the person's heart and soul. So measure the person's heart and soul. And see how many people are actually worshiping the true and the living God. Wouldn't that be a task? Wouldn't it be a task to have to take a measuring, read, and begin to try to find people that really worshiped God? didn't just try to go through the motions, but were really worshiping the true 
and the living God. Because throughout the generations, throughout the years, there have been people in the Scriptures, most especially in, in John's day, there have been people that were worshiping falsely. There have been people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that had taken over worship and didn't know who God really was. They would come to worship service every Sabbath day. They would give and make really big guest gestures with their giving. They would give alms to the poor. They knew the scriptures. They preached from the pulpits, if you will. And so it looked good, but it was all false worship, and that's why Christ came in. And that false worship was still out there, even as late as 90 A.D., and he said, John, measure the worship. Measure the worship. And I begin to think about the scriptures. And you think about what Paul said when he said, you're going to get to heaven and you're going to have to answer for every word Indeed. And here's the thing. He's not talking to lost people. You know, lost people don't get to heaven. He's talking about Christians when they show up at the gates of heaven and they see Jesus, they're going to have to answer. Say people are going to have to answer for what they did and didn't do for the kingdom of God and why they did what they did and why they didn't do what they were supposed to do, we're going to have to answer for every word and deed. And so the angel said, take the reed and measure the heart and soul of the dwelling place of God And the offering to God from the worshipers. And see who comes up lacking. That's what it's implied. You wonder why verse 2 is there. And I remember the two brothers walking down the road. And there was a town that had not received them well and James and John said, let's call fire down from heaven and let's burn them up. Notice this, the unworthy of measuring but leave out the court which is outside the temple. You see, outside the main temple was the court of the Gentiles or the court of the nations. And so he says, and do not measure it, for it was given to these Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months. That's not a long time. So we know it's not just 42 months, right? We know it's a symbolic number. Three being human completeness, this is three and a half. It's an imperfect number. So he says, don't measure outside, that outside court. Don't measure those that are unworthy, those that are not worshiping. Don't, don't try to measure what they're doing because they're not doing what is required to be a part of the kingdom of of God. And the Gentiles and the nations, whatever your translation might read, it could have either word, it's the same word in the Greek. They're lost. It's a reference to lost people. And that's why the Jews used to call us Gentiles. Because we were outside the covenant relationship with God. And they were calling us lost people. And right 
rightly so, because most Gentiles were lost. And so John is referencing that again in this vision. God referenced that, and he says, don't measure the lost people. They have no worship. They have no altar. They're not giving to God the things that are due God. They're not offering their worship to God. They have nothing to answer for. They're not coming into the kingdom of God. They're not coming to the gates of heaven. They won't stand before Christ. They won't have to answer in that sense for every word and deed. They won't have to answer. They'll have to answer for why did you reject Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Three and a half years of imperfection. They will trod underfoot the things of God. We look at our society today. We look at the world today. And we see things that are out of control. We don't know why things happen like they do. We don't know why people get away with the things they get away with. We don't understand how it just continues to, to go on and on, and there's just nothing that God seems to be doing about it. But we know that God is in control. Six trumpets. The seventh trumpet is coming. And God has given us encouragement. And these two verses should give you great encouragement if don't you like that two letter word if you're doing what God has called you to do that's great encouragement but then you come to verse 3 and verse 3 is just it's a powerful verse and it comes to the two prophets. And this is, this is one of the hardest verses for people just to get right. And I don't know if I got it right or not, because there's so many different views. You look at verse 3, and I will give power to my two witnesses. And those words, there are books and commentaries, and with difference of opinions. And so I just took, I took the top four. I broke down the verse, and these two prophets will have power. I mean, we're going to study them in the next week or so, and they're going to have unusual power. Read Revelation, and you'll see the power. And they're going to prophesy. And prophesy means to proclaim and to preach. And they're going to do the 1260 days, which if you understand, divide that by 30 day, the Hebrew calendar, and you come up with what? 42 months, which is how many, how many months is that? How many years would that be? Three and a half years. That's an imperfect number. Remember that. And they're going to wear sackcloth. Now, what is that? Well, that's what you wear when you're mourning. That's what you wear when you're sorrowful. So you're going to have these two prophets that are proclaiming with power the word of God, and they're going to do it with mourning, and they're sorrowful. And they... But who are they? Who are they? So here are the best four guesses. Guess number one. These get your highest votes. Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Moses brought the law. Elijah, the greatest prophet. A lot of commentaries and a lot of people that wrote books about revelations, they will choose that these two prophets are going to be Moses and Elijah, and they're going to come back, and they're going to breathe fire. Guess number two. 
Number two is Enoch and Elijah. You know why they picked Enoch and Elijah? Somebody tell me. Never died. So they make the top list. These two guys are going to come back and they're going to die, finally going to die. Who knows? But then there's number three. The church and the scriptures. I mean, the church is still here. I'm liking this better. I mean, we're still here through ten chapters and we've been given a great commission and we're one of the witnesses and the other, the scriptures. I, I kind of like that. But then, y'all read the title of my sermon tonight, right? Which is what? Law of the Prophets. Do you understand the one I like? Because Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law or the prophets. And the law and the prophets has been, is, and will be all that we ever need to come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Where do you find the law and the prophets, by the way? Anybody know? In the Bible, Miss Patty. So when I read this and I look at it and I think, as we get into it, we're always going to have God's Word. And who are the two prophets? It's the law and the prophets are right here. And included in this is Moses and Elijah and Enoch and Abraham. And guess what? There's a bunch of Jews in this thing. Peter, James, and John, and the greatest Jew of all, Jesus the Christ, they're in the Scriptures. And this is all we need. And will it breathe fire? Well, there was fire that came from a rock. And will the sun stop? Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. This is all we need. And over the next coming weeks, we're going to talk about the two prophets. And if you really want to know about the two prophets, you got to have one of these. Because this is where you called the Bible. And I'm going to stop right there tonight. Because we're going to eat finger foods. <laughs>